Well, if you have either the Bible that you were given on the way in or an app or such, do, uh, do get hold of it because we'll be jumping around a little bit tonight. So our evening series, we've come to, to the next in our evening series where we're asking the question about whether God's people were building back better. If you've been joining us over the last few weeks, you will know the story so far in the book of Nehemiah. We are reading the Old Testament account of a Jewish man named Nehemiah who lived two and a half thousand years ago in the Middle East. And tonight we've reached chapter five. If you're struggling to find him in your Bibles, his book is boxed in by Ezra and Esther. Uh, and tonight's chapter starts on uh, 487, if you need to refind it. And do turn with me there. Now, if, like me, it helps you to have something visual, uh, to, uh, this graphic might be helpful for you. We're reading about how God's people are returning to Jerusalem and embarking on rebuilding projects. The kings who are ruling the region are Persian, and you'll no doubt recognize their names at the top of this slide. The exiled people returned in three waves, and we are focusing on the third wave as we look at Nehemiah. Now, as we've learned over the last few weeks, Nehemiah had an important job in service to the Persian king Artaxerxes. He was cupbearer, a job of service and protection, because he would have tasted the wine before he served it to the king. And this meant that Nehemiah was a regular member of the court and in the king's inner circle, so to speak. And we get the sense from what we read in the early chapters of the book that the king had both respect and affection for his cupbearer. Noticing at the start of chapter two when Nehemiah was out of sorts and in due course honoring Nehemiah's requests for the king's support as the story unfolds. And so far in the story, we have already seen a run of different kinds of issue emerging for Nehemiah. The main one, of course, is that at the start of his book, we get the news, along with Nehemiah, that the attempts at rebuilding the walls of his spiritual homeland, Jerusalem, have been frustrated. And more importantly, that his people, the so-called remnant, are in trouble and disgrace. And as Nehemiah hears this, he is compelled to take on the responsibility for doing something about it. So first and foremost, we see this whole story is built on a personal issue for him. So it's built on a personal issue. In chapter two, we then read of how he faces a political issue in asking the king, his employer, to release him, to go and orchestrate the building project. Next, we see the administrative and practical issues of finding people and material to get on with the necessary work. Then, in chapter four, we see the physical issue of threatened violence to the builders, and then the emotional and psychological issues which emerge as they become disheartened during the hard and now potentially life-risking work. So all of that brings us to tonight's chapter, where we will see that Nehemiah faces economic and social issues, which are born out of sinful behavior which turns out to be painfully close to home. Tonight, we're going to cover some big themes around sin and God and see how one man, Nehemiah, provides an answer at this point in history. But great as Nehemiah and his story is, we are also going to see that it leaves us wanting more. So let's turn to chapter five together. As we join Nehemiah's story tonight, we are dropped straight into a series of complaints. 
The women and men of the Jewish rebuilding community are effectively bringing their 5th century BC cost of living crisis to Nehemiah, who was their governor. And they were facing this crisis for a host of different reasons. Of course, the weeks away from their normal occupations so that they could work on the walls will have contributed to their lack of income. But in addition, there, were severe fam there was severe famine in the region, as well as punishing levels of taxation, which of course were nothing to do with the rebuilding. And for all of these reasons, they have run out of money. They cannot feed themselves or their families, nor pay the taxes that they owe. And as we read this historical account tonight, whilst of course there isn't perfect read across, there is obvious resonance with the plight of people all over the world today. People who are facing our modern day cost of living crisis, fueled by the economic impact of the COVID pandemic, the global increase in the cost of energy and, and the war in Ukraine. Our modern day situation is rightly called a crisis and it can lead to desperate acts for the people most affected by it. Just as the people in our Old Testament story are facing hardship on multiple fronts, many of the nations most affected by our current cost of living crisis are those which have been beset by multiple disasters over many years. You will recognize many of the countries in this list from the UNDP, from news stories of war, famine, unscrupulous governments and natural disasters which have already ravaged them. The three that are highlighted in yellow on this slide are also places in the Open Doors persecution list. This is the list of countries where following Jesus costs people the most. We need to be praying for our Christian brothers and sisters in these countries especially. There are issues closer to home too. In a recent survey in the UK, as many as one in seven adults say that they can't afford to eat every day. The poorest families are the most affected by the current price rises because food and energy bills make up a bigger part of their monthly outgoings. In their recent report, the Centre for Social Justice warns that the combination of pressures on household budgets, low financial resilience and increasingly limited credit options is liable to create a perfect storm in which people are driven towards exploitation. They estimate that this current cost of living crisis means that right now, over a million people in the UK are likely to be borrowing from illegal money lenders or loan sharks. Now this should give us pause. People in our nation and our world, even now this evening, are facing poverty and hardship and therefore the potential for exploitation by those who would take advantage of that. And as we return to chapter five, and our Bible story, in verses 2, 3, and 4, we read of the Jerusalem wall builders mortgaging homes, fields, and vineyards, taking loans with unmanageable interest rates, and ultimately taking the extreme step of selling their children into slavery, presumably to reduce the number of mouths to feed, as well as to receive money from their sale to buy grain and pay tax. In the words that we've just read from this 21st century Center for Social Justice, these people in 5th century BC Jerusalem were facing a perfect storm of pressures and it had driven them towards exploitation. Now this list of desperate acts in the face of crushing poverty is troubling enough. But the real shocker is that verses one and five make it clear that the crippling mortgages, loans, and the slave trading are not at the hands of unscrupulous enemy nations, but rather they are all at the hands of their fellow countrymen. 
the exploitation of these people who have answered the call to rebuild Jerusalem's walls is being meted out by some of the better off members of God's people. The next few verses of our chapter are taken up with Nehemiah's response to these complaints. A response which we will see involves emotion, thought, and then a wide range of action. So let's take a look together. First, in verse 6, we read that Nehemiah was very angry. The people's report immediately provokes a strong emotional response from their governor. His emotion would no doubt have been intensified by the details of what he hears, because they describe mistreatment of a kind specifically dealt with in the scriptures. The law in Exodus 22, Deuteronomy 15 and 24, and Leviticus 25, talked about how to treat people who found themselves struggling in ways just like these men and women. At its heart was generosity and mercy, certainly not exploitation. The law promoted the idea that lenders should not press their rights even where they had an agreement, if doing so would mean that the borrower was put in a position of vulnerability and distress. Verses 7 and 8 of Deuteronomy 15 say, If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites, in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. In other parts of the Old Testament law, taking your Jewish brothers and sisters as slaves was forbidden, and so was charging them interest on loans. This open-handed, generous attitude of God's law was not being lived out, and his people were being exploited. And Nehemiah is passionate about the heartbeat of God's law and about God's people. Blatant disregard of either, and indeed both, evoked a strong emotional response in Nehemiah. As I was preparing this sermon for tonight, the way Nehemiah responds in this chapter reminded me of our Lord Jesus. We need only read of his actions in Jerusalem nearly 500 years later, with the money changers in the temple courts, to recognize this kind of anger, righteous anger, not focused on our own infringed rights, but rather inflamed by sinful injustice perpetrated against those in need. So the first few things that I want to draw out of tonight's story are all about sin. The sin which caused God's people to be exiled from Jerusalem and Judah in the first place was still evident in their poor treatment of their brothers and sisters even as their promise to return to Jerusalem and restoration is being enacted. Our series is called Building Back Better. And the question mark is important. Because even as we see the return of the exiles and Nehemiah leading the rebuilding of the walls, it's clear that this new start, this rebuilding in Jerusalem, has not eradicated sin. Sin remained a perpetual part of their daily experience, and their sin and its consequences, particularly those consequences meted out on the poor and vulnerable, made Nehemiah angry. However, whilst anger is his first response, we're not left there with only the emotion right as it was. Verse 7 explains how he moves from emotion to thought, we read that he ponders the charges in his mind. Another translation says he took counsel with himself. He contains his initial emotion and he brings his reason and thought to bear. And he moves then from thought to action, immediately taking what he has learned to the officials and nobles and accusing them calling out their actions. Because you see, sin 
especially that which involves the exploitation of the poor, needy, and vulnerable who cannot defend themselves, should be called out. It was right for the men and women to speak out against their mistreatment, and it was right for Nehemiah, in his position of power and influence, to speak out on their behalf too. I wonder, are you being prompted tonight to call out mistreatment, either of yourself or others, perhaps in your workplace or your neighbourhood or even amongst God's people? If you are, don't leave here tonight without praying with someone about it. In the verses that follow, we see Nehemiah's continued response. After his initial anger and then the private accusation to the nobles and officials, he goes on to take a public approach with the goal of provoking a change of heart and action in his listeners. Verse 7 explains that he calls a community meeting where he lays out a fuller account of the officials and nobles' misdemeanors in the presence of those they have wronged. So effective is this strategy of public accountability in front of their victims that it leaves the officials and noblemen speechless. Verse 8 tells us they kept quiet because they had nothing to say. And in case anyone at the community meeting had missed his point, Nehemiah drives at home with all the clarity of a man anointed by God. In verse 9, he says, What you are doing is not right. The moral unacceptability of the treatment of their fellow countrywomen and men is without question. That is bad enough. But Nehemiah goes further in verse 9 as he explains that their actions also disempower their testimony to the surrounding nations. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies, he says. Because you see, how God's people treated one another mattered then for their witness to the world, just as it matters now for us. Remember these words of Jesus recorded for us by John. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. We as God's people are absolutely called to stand up for the poor and needy in the world at large. But also, as the church family, we must role model what the new and coming kingdom under Christ's rule will be like. People should be able to look at how Christians treat one another and be astonished by our love. This should be a powerful witness to Christ, just as in the Old Testament, how God's people treated one another was to be a powerful witness to Yahweh. Now, however, look down with me at verse 10. Nehemiah goes on to explain that these nobles and officials he has just accused are not the only ones lending money and grain. He and his inner circle are too. And he shares the responsibility for a change of behavior with those who he has accused. Let us stop charging interest, he says, verse 10. This is a public declaration by Nehemiah that the sin he was calling out was as close to home as it's possible to be. It was being perpetrated by him and his inner circle, albeit potentially to a lesser degree, or even without Nehemiah knowing. Because his outrage when first hearing the plight of the men and women suggests real shock at what was going on. But with that public confession of sin in verse 10, Nehemiah goes on to give a full description of what repentance should look like. He tells them to stop charging interest, verse 10, give back the property and possessions, and give back a proportion of the interest already removed, verse 11. The correct response to sin are confession and then repentance. A change of heart discernible by a change of behavior. So this chapter in Nehemiah reminds us of some important truths about sin. 
Sin is a perpetual part of theirs and our human experience. Sin and its consequences make our holy God angry, and they should make his people angry too. Confession and repentance should be the response where there is sin. And as we read on, verse 12 outlines the full commitment by those accused to a change of behavior, entirely in step with Nehemiah's demands. We will give it back. We will not demand anything more. We will do as you say. Nehemiah has called out sin, modeled confession and repentance as the correct response, and evoked a change as a consequence. We will do as you say, is their reply. And it's right that we just take a moment out to look at this Old Testament act of repentance together. And as we do, let's reconsider the title of our series, Building Back Better, and the fact that it's a question. Those of you who know your Old Testament will know that, amongst other things, it's a record of the perpetual and repeated failure of God's people to live God's way. It's the story of willful willful disobedience by some, as well as gradual slippage by others, even as they try. We read of a turning away and then a turning back, a turning away and then a turning back. And the turning back is often at the intervention of one man or woman as a prophet or a leader. But the same pattern repeats, a turning away and then a turning back. Now, if you have your Bibles, I wonder if you can glance down with me at Jeremiah 31. Now, though Jeremiah came before Nehemiah, historically, his book comes afterwards in our Bibles, which is confusing. You'll need to jump to page 792 if you're struggling to find it. Jeremiah 31. Now, this chapter is a prophecy It's all about God's people being returned from scattered exile to God's place for them under God's rule. It describes how God will watch over them. And verse 28 tells us he will build and plant. And then verse 38 says the days are coming when this city will be rebuilt for me. And then in the very last line of the chapter we read... The rebuilt city will never again be uprooted or demolished. Now, I wonder how many of the people in our story in Nehemiah tonight thought that the prophecy of Jeremiah 31 and the bringing back and the rebuilding that it describes was what they were living out as they returned to Jerusalem then. But of course, with the benefit of hindsight, we know Uh, that what they were living through was only a glimpse and a shadow of future restoration. We know that what would follow for these people was further failure, because radical change, the new covenant described in verse 33 of this chapter in Jeremiah, was yet to come. The true fulfillment of building back better The new covenant, when God's law would be written on the hearts of his people, would only be ushered in by the coming of the Lord Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit to the hearts of all believers. Nehemiah's story is an important but an incomplete foretaste of God's ultimate restoration plan for his people. So with that slight foray, let's return to our passage for tonight Back to page 488, if you've lost your place, and Nehemiah chapter 5. We've just read in verse 12 that Nehemiah's challenge has resulted in a public commitment to a change of behavior. Nehemiah doesn't leave it there, however. In the next few lines in our passage, he solidifies their promise in two ways. First, he invokes the social and spiritual power of a public oath in the presence of God's representatives, the priests, to keep the officials honest to their word. 
You can see this at the tail end of verse 12. Then second, in verse 13, he reminds them that it is God who ultimately upholds the case of the poor and who will wreak judgment on anyone who continues to exploit them. We read that Nehemiah shakes out the folds of his robe, acting out what God will do to any who renege on their promise to repay and release their fellow countrymen. This is a powerful image which underlines to us that God is on the side of the poor and oppressed. We have example after example through the Old Testament of God's attitude to and expectations for the poor. For the poor. <clears throat> Psalm 9, he won't forget them. Psalm 12, he will protect them. Proverbs 14, he expects people to show them kindness. You see, Nehemiah is for the poor and oppressed because his God is. And we read that his challenge brings the whole assembly to worship the Lord, verse 13, and keep their word. What a response. In this episode, we see that as well as dealing with the material needs of the people, Nehemiah brings the spiritual need of the whole community front and center, reminding them of God's word and bringing them back to focus on God. At the end of verse 13, we read the whole assembly praised the Lord. Now, the last third of our chapter allows us to get a further glimpse of the kind of governor Nehemiah is and how his actions are all driven by what verse 15 describes as his reverence for God. We read of how his way of governing is not like that of those who came before him. Not only is he now a lender who does not charge interest, but verse 15 explains how he does not claim the food, wine, or money that was typically allotted to a governor. Nor does he or his people take a superior attitude to those being governed. Notice how Nehemiah's approach to being governor resonates with the new kingdom approach that Jesus describes in Luke 22. In Luke, Jesus tells the disciples not to be like the kings of the Gentiles, but rather that the one who rules should be like the one who serves. Because, Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. Nehemiah and his men are living out this attitude hundreds of years before Jesus. They are public servants whose sole focus is on the job of rebuilding out of reverence for God and for the good of God's people. Verse 16 explains that they did not acquire the perks of office, but rather they fed and looked after others from their own abundance in verse 17 and 18. 500 years before Jesus, Nehemiah is role modeling exactly the behavior that Jesus asks of both leaders and the church more widely. Remember, the mark of his disciples was to be that they loved one another. So, how can we summarize tonight's story? Well, I suppose what we have in this chapter is a great practical example in Nehemiah of someone living out the great commandments to love God and to love others. The commandments outlined in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and reaffirmed by our Lord Jesus. Love God and love others. Not only did Nehemiah live them out, but he helped provide the context and motivation for others to do so too. We know he played his part in the history of God's people, calling out sin, encouraging repentance and worship, rebuilding God's city. All of these are foreshadowing of what would be coming when the true building back better would begin with the first coming of Jesus and to be finally completed at his return. So how might we apply what we've looked at tonight? Well, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit uses and perhaps already has used these verses to speak directly to you. And if so, listen to his prompting and pray through it. I also offer some of the things that he's been drawing my attention to as I've prepared for tonight. First, God can use you 
even if you haven't got everything right. Nehemiah felt the challenge of his own sin, even as he challenged those around him. And God used him all the same. How much more might this be true for those of us who live this side of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and have the Holy Spirit working in our hearts? We don't need to have everything right in order to engage in kingdom purposes. Let us be people who, like Nehemiah, respond to sin in our own lives, even as we help others to do the same, with confession and repentance. Jesus can use repentant sinners, be encouraged, and be invigorated. Second, I think we should be encouraged by the fact that God used years of faithful service in Nehemiah's everyday job to equip him for his next purpose. We might view the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls as the purpose for which God created Nehemiah in all its significance, peril, and grandeur. But he couldn't have achieved it without the experiences and relationships built up in his faithful daily endeavors over many years. Being faithful where you are now in your day-to-day endeavors, that has great value. Be encouraged that God will be equipping you for whatever he has next for you. Third and finally, God is extravagantly and holy for the poor and oppressed. And so should we be, both for material and spiritual poverty. Whilst now is not the time for an extensive discussion about material versus spiritual need, I have found this explanation of how the physical and spiritual are related really helpful. Jay Kangaraj, in his study on John's Gospel, explains, it's noteworthy that in grasping Jesus' identity, the hungry and the sick found their real human identity. In brief, in John's Gospel, Jesus fulfills the needs of the poor, not just to give them temporary relief, but primarily to lead them to see God's glory and be transformed by it. God cares about material and spiritual hunger, and he calls us to meet both needs. In his story, Nehemiah has modeled to us the need for emotion, thought, and then action. What issue which people or persons cause can you champion? What injustice in your own life or the lives of others do you need to call out? What resources do you have that others might need so that in the words of Galatians, we might do good to all people and especially to those who belong to the family of believers? Let me encourage you to look at some of the mercy ministries in which Cornerstone and the wider church in Nottingham are involved. You can see information about those over at the Connect board, which is just behind those screens. Prayerfully consider whether God is calling you to serve the spiritual and physical needs of our world in this way, to play our part in building back better. Whatever the Holy Spirit is prompting you about tonight, ask for his help to balance these three responses of emotion, thought, and action in the face of need for king and kingdom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we long for you, our perfect king, to reign over your perfect kingdom, where the chaos and brokenness of this world have gone and all of your people are filled, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Help us to be doing our part in building such a kingdom now, even as we wait for its completion when you return. Amen.